Good morning and welcome to today's news conference with NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei. Mark is scheduled to launch to the International Space Station from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan on April 9th aboard at the Soyuz spacecraft. He will launch with his crewmates Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov of the Russian space agency Roscosmos. Mark will be a flight engineer and a member of Expedition 64-65 crew. He was selected as an astronaut in 2009, and he completed his first space flight in 2018 as part of Expedition 53 and 54 aboard the International Space Station. He spent 168 days in space and completed four spacewalks. Mark is a retired colonel in the U.S. Army and has physics degrees from St. John's University in Minnesota, as well as Stanford University in California. Now we'll pass it over to Mark for some opening remarks, and then we'll take questions. For media on the phone, please press star one if you have a question and star two to withdraw your question if it's already been asked. So now we'll go over to Mark. How are you feeling about your upcoming mission? Hey, Megan, thanks a lot for the question. I am really, really excited. I've uh, been training for as a backup for Kate Rubin's launch last back in October. Um, and just as a contingency, I was training for this just in case it got finalized and I'm super happy that it did and I'm feeling very ready to go. That is great to hear. Okay, now we'll take some questions from the media. Let's start with Joey Roulette with The Verge. Um, so this flight was arranged uh, pretty in the last minute. Uh, which is kind of unusual, I think, for, for NASA's uh, Soyuz missions. And I was wondering how your training has been and, and when did you first find out that you actually got this assignment that you're going to fly? Thanks. Uh, this is kind of a funny story, but I found out the same time I think everybody else did. One of my high school friends told my wife that there was a Twitter announcement that say, said it was finalized. Of course, the only reason that happened was because it was the middle of the night. I was sound asleep. Otherwise, I'm sure I would have found out earlier. I didn't look at my email until later. Um, I, again, I was just super happy. It was something that had been in the works for months, trying to make it happen. Lots of challenges, and people worked super hard to get it actually finalized. But that entire time, regardless, uh, I, as a member of uh, uh, really four people, because we weren't sure if uh, the Russian that I replaced, Sergei, Sergei Korsakov, or I were going to be flying, all four of us were training for that spacecraft with only three seats in it. So we were ready for whatever contingency we needed to do, and uh, that's how we ended up today, ready to go. Okay, let's go to Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. How long will you be staying at the space station, given that some Russian movie types may be launching in the fall and likely needing your return seat? And I'm wondering, is there a chance you'd have a full year mission by chance, and what would you think about that? Uh, actually, yes, there's a chance, and it all depends, just like you said, Marcia, on whether or not those tourists go up on the spacecraft in the fall, because they would take my seat back, so I'd have to stay longer to wait for another seat. Um, honestly, for me, it's just an opportunity for a new life experience. I've never been in space longer than about six months, so if someone tells me i got to stay in space for a year, I'll find out what that feels like. Um, I'm, ex I'm really enthusiastic about it. And the reason I say that, too, is because on the previous flight, it felt like every day got a little bit easier. I was more comfortable with things as time went on. I was much more familiar with my work. So my perspective is I'm going back to a job, and instead of being the new employee that Joe sh just showed up, I'm going to be somebody who worked there worked there in the, in the lab a couple years ago, and I'll start off a little better than I was the first time, and I'll get to continue at that job longer. So hopefully I'll be able to contribute even more. All right, let's take the next question from Austin DeSisto with Everyday Astronaut. Hello, Mark. Um, my question is, how might life be different up there? Will there be 10 and 11 people at times, um, both when working and in periods of free time? Uh, great question. My experience has been that it's both more exciting and a little more chaotic when you have more people on the space station. Uh, the resources are limited, so for example, we have to very tightly manage who is working out on which exercise device at what time. Um, but again, we're very socially isolated on the space station. There's times when you only have a couple other people of all of humanity that you get to actually have face-to-face -face interaction with. 
So having an opportunity where for, for some period of time where we have 11, I think that'll be good and probably healthy psychologically. Okay, next question from Jeff Faust with Space News. Yeah, I just wanted to revisit some of the earlier questions about uh, the, the timing for all of this. Um, when was it first uh, broached the possibility that you might fly on this April mission and, and the fact that you were training simultaneously um, with the, the Russian crewmates for that? Um, you know, you, you heard it from the Twitter announcement. I'm just curious when the, the training process started and how it was different from the training from your first trip to the space station. Thanks. Uh, another great question. So for me, it felt like a very um, nominal training flow. And I say that because even though I started late for the backup training for, like I mentioned earlier, the launch in October, um, because of COVID concerns and transportation requirements, I actually got sent to Russia to train on the Russian systems a little earlier than I normally would have. My previous experience, I had more responsibilities on the spacecraft and less time to train, so it felt much more stressful. This time, I had more time in Russia to train with fewer responsibilities and, frankly, more experience. So it felt much more comfortable. Uh, it, it felt uh, more relaxed. And then as that flowed right into this next um, uh, preparation for this launch coming up in April, that was uh, just as comfortable. I, I really, the only thing that was uh, uncertain was whether or not I would actually launch as a result of doing the training. But the training progressed throughout. I actually realized after they, uh, after I saw the Twitter feed that I had been really managing my expectations. I was trying not to get too emotionally, ex to get too excited about the fact that I may be launching in April. Um, and I only realized that I had been doing that when I felt super excited when it was actually finalized. All right, we'll take the next question from Bill Hardwood, Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. Um, can you talk just a little bit about why it's so important for NASA to have an American launch aboard the Soyuz and the importance in general of ensuring a continuous presence, uh, you know, a USOS continuous presence on ISS, uh, given that, that that might keep you up there for a year just, just for that very reason? Thanks. Well, I would say the reason I'm launching is really to make sure we have a continued U.S. presence. Um, the reason I would stay for a year is really just about making sure that uh, it's, it's a function of the Russians' desire to try alternate ways to uh, launch people to space or draw in a larger pool of the population to take the space. Um, so for me, uh, we've had continuous human presence in space. When I say we, I mean the United States for the well, greater than the last 20 years. And if there is a chance, if, we, if I wasn't on the spacecraft, and a, one of our commercial spacecraft was delayed in launching, that we would actually end up with only Russians on the spacecraft for the first time. Now, there's issues associated with familiarity with the U.S. segment of the space station, that certainly American astronauts have more training, more, are more thoroughly versed in how to operate that portion of the space station. So there's operational issues. But there's also very symbolic issues. It's, we've had a, a very successful unbroken cooperation with our international partners and had human presence there. So I, I, I think both operationally and symbolically, symbolically, it is very important. All right, just a reminder, if you have questions on social media, you can use them using the hashtag AskNASA. And if you're on the phone, media can raise their hand to ask a question by pressing star one. Now we'll go to a question from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi, thank you. Um, We saw that you uh, getting, or, sorry, um, <laughs> getting back to the the late uh, nature of your flight becoming official. We saw that you had your MS-18 patch with your name on it, so there was time for that. But will you have your clothing on board when you arrive? Will you have your menu choices, or will those come later? Or how are they managing uh, the logistics for this? Thanks. Uh, great question. Um, we had. I, I, there was a point in my preparation for this flight when there was a, I may have ended up having to wear a much larger astronaut's clothing on the space station. But uh, folks on the ground did manage to forecast that this might work out and go ahead and get my stuff shipped up. So I, I'm expecting it to be there when I arrive. 
Um, also, an interesting thing about the patch is we actually had two versions of the patch made up. The Russians made up one version with three Russian names on it and one version with my name on it instead of one of the Russians. And just to show uh, camaraderie amongst the four of us, I wore the patch with the three Russians' name on it for a while, and uh, Sergei Korsakov, the wonderful, wonderful cosmonaut who is not going to be able to watch with us, but I will always consider to be a part of our team. He was wearing the uh, patch with my name on it until we found out for sure who was actually going to fly. That's awesome, and we're glad to hear that you're going to have your clothes up there. That's great. <laughs> um, let's take a question from Eric Newland with St. Cloud Times. Uh, good morning from Minnesota, Mark. Uh, my question is, um, are you expecting to have any communication with folks back home? Um, back in 2018, we covered you uh, talking with uh, uh, St. John's University folks. Uh, can we expect to hear from you um, down here? I am certainly hoping to arrange that. I've got some uh, opportunities to request uh, particular events, and uh, certainly St. John's is on the list. Awesome. Right. Okay, you. now we're going to take a couple of questions that have come in on social media. We have a fourth grade class that's asking you a few questions. Uh, the first one is, can you play video games in space? I believe you can. In fact, I think our behavior, health, and performance group has the ability to upload those games at your request. However, uh, that would be something that if I got started on, I'd be afraid to have a hard time stopping. So I have no desire to start a computer game on the space station. That's fair. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of other things to do on board there. All right. They also want to know if you're worried if anything will go wrong. That's an interesting question. So we, in a way, we have the appropriate amount of worry to recognize things can go wrong. And the way we deal with that is we train for all the situations where things can go wrong. In fact, um, we train so hard in, the, in that Soyuz spacecraft that I'll launch in, that last time I launched, I mean, when I say we train so hard, we train so hard on so many things going wrong that when we actually launched and nothing went wrong, it felt weird. I was constantly on the lookout trying to figure out what was the next thing that was going to go wrong, and the spacecraft worked flawlessly. Um, so yeah, we're very well prepared for lots and lots of things to go wrong, from fires to rapid depressurizations, um, toxic substance leaks. Um, we're ready for those things, and I'm very confident that when faced with those situations, we will be able to survive and keep the space station running. All right. Um, and last question from them, how long can someone stay in space? Well, that's a good question. I do not know the answer. I'm sure it's at least a year because we've had that happen a few times. Um, but no, I, I don't know how long it is. That's something that we're, um, we expect to have to put people in space for well more than a year in the future to be able to explore further into the solar system. And a lot of the science we are doing on the space station is helping us to understand how to keep people healthy while they're in an environment where they're basically in a free fall and we're, we're not, we haven't evolved to operate in an environment super well, but our bodies are very adaptable. So we need to make sure that when we get to someplace new, that we can still function very well, just like we can on the ground on the earth. All right. Let's take another question on the line from William, William Schwimhammer with the record. Greetings, William. William, can you hear us? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, <laughs> another hello from St. John's. Uh, my question today is, in the last three years since your mission to space, what have you missed most? Miss most about space? Yes. Uh, the absolute freedom of motion. So imagine you can uh, go flying through the center stack of the space station and going head first with your arms out in front of you like Superman. And then when you want to go around a corner, you can just grab onto a handrail and let your feet swing wide and you end up uh, going feet first in the other direction. Um, I got comfortable enough with the environment that eventually I could, I could be standing with my hands crossed with my feet hooked under something on the floor. And then I, I was looking for an object to do some work on the space station. And then I just 
notice the object on the ceiling, and I flipped upside down, hooked my feet on the ceiling without even unfolding my arms, and then grabbed the object. So it's, it can be really, really fun once you get past the initial discomfort of the weirdness of the whole thing, but it gets really, really, really fun. All right, let's take a question from Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi again. Um, the last time you flew, it was just before the 60th anniversary of the first satellite Sputnik. Now you're launching again uh, just around the 60th anniversary of the first human in space. I think I asked you a similar question last time, but can you share your thoughts about the progress that has been made over the past six decades of human space exploration leading up to your own flight now? Yes. Wow. A really good question. Um, certainly 60 years ago, when we were doing this, it was in the midst of a huge competition between Russia and the United States, which helped actually spur our efforts. Uh, but that first flight was one person, um, not for very long, and it was a effort that one country could take a lot of pride in. Now our space flights, we have people staying in orbit for, as we already talked about, close to a year. And they're always, because right now we've been doing this as our country and the Russians with the Japanese, Canadians, lots of uh, members of the European Space Agency. Um, we've been doing this as an international effort, and I'm very, very proud of that because I think it's a very good sign for humanity that we've progressed from doing things kind of as single countries to, to being more and more cooperative because I think that's what humanity is really going to need to be able to be, continue to have these kind of successes. All right. Uh, Marcia Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, uh, another question for you, Mark, if I might. I'm wondering if you and your Russian crewmates have gotten your COVID vaccines. Um, if so, when and where? And are you taking any other special precautions to stay healthy between now and April 9th? Uh, I did have a first vaccine back in the United States before I came to Russia. I, we were just talking before this started about the details of my next vaccine coming up this week. Um, I'm not sure of the status of my Russian crewmates as far as their vaccines are concerned, but I can tell you until we get into quarantine in Baikonur, even when the three of us are together, we're all wearing masks all the time. When, even in the Soyuz simulator when we're shoulder to shoulder and I'm in a spacesuit because the air actually gets exchanged between those spacesuits in some instances, I wear a mask. It's not very comfortable, but it's the right thing to do. So we're, we're still trying to protect us at, during a time when we're interacting with a, a larger group of people than we will certainly on the space station or in quarantine. We're still trying to make sure we're isolating ourselves socially. All right, let's take a question from Joey Roulette with The Verge. Hey, thanks. Um, so your training and pre-launch activities seem pretty normal and you know pretty much as any other uh, NASA astronaut mission, um, but I was just wondering if you were plugged in at all to um, the you know, agreement with Axiom that uh, arranged this seat for you. Um, and, do you. And do you have any kind of idea of why NASA chose to go through Ax Axiom instead of uh, Rock Cosmos? Thanks. Uh, great question. Fortunately for me, I did not have to get into the deals of the contract law to make that happen. Uh, I know, I, all I can really tell you is I know that Axiom um, was involved and there's no exchange of funds because what NASA got out of the deal was Axiom uh, doing the coordination and arranging for uh, me to have that seat, for me on behalf of NASA to be in that seat. And then what NASA is providing to Axiom is the promise of a seat on a U.S. commercial spacecraft in the future. So it, uh, I'm sure it was a very complicated, challenging thing to work out. I know a lot of effort went into making it happen and with, with time constraints because we knew that if we didn't get it figured out, uh, there was a chance we wouldn't be able to get the seat in time. So I'm really happy it worked out the way it did, and I'm also very happy that I did not have to deal with all those details. That makes sense. All right, let's take a couple more questions on social media. Chris on Twitter wants to know if you've cross-trained on any of the commercial crew vehicles. Have you had any experience with the um, SpaceX Crew Dragon or the Boeing Starliner vehicles? Another fantastic question. I actually have not. The only exposure I've had to U.S. commercial crew vehicles was before I was assigned, was going out to Hawthorne to, to go to their factory and look at the storage spaces in the Crew Dragon spacecraft. As somebody who had experience in space, 
to give them some feedback on what I thought, how the crew would react to having to access these particular places. Uh, I wasn't really training for me. It was an opportunity for them to get some feedback on, on how their spacecraft would work for an astronaut in flight. Um, uh, it's an amazing spacecraft. Um, I have had some training on how the uh, system works when it's docking and monitoring that docking, but uh, that, that's really it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Stephanie on Facebook is asking, how long does it take to physically get acclimated when you arrive to the space station? Uh, my wife tells me that it took me longer than I claimed because I, I think I told her it took about, I, I, maybe I tuned out the hard parts, but I think it, about two weeks I was feeling okay. I, I really didn't have a lot of nausea like some people did. But even that, um, my mom said, wait a minute, you told me you had nausea. So I, I think I've, I've forgotten some of the bad parts. Uh, after the first month, I think I started feeling like I had created habits to work in an environment that required lots and lots of conscious effort. Let me explain a little bit more. Um, when you put something down on a table, you don't really have to think about it. You set it there, you have to think about where you left it, but it's gonna stay there. Not a lot of mental effort. I got on the space station without a lot of mental effort. I looked at the wall and I stuck a blood vial on the uh, wall on a piece of Velcro. Turned my back to it, came back to get the blood vial, it was gone. I had stuck uh, like pieces of Velcro together without recognizing that they, weren't, they wouldn't stick for very long. And it had floated away. Uh, I found that in all kinds of instances, the way I normally operate, uh, instead of being something that I could do, just flow through it and let things naturally happen without really having to pay constant attention, I couldn't do that. It felt very exhausting for the first month because so many things required me to, to pay attention to every little detail. But it got easier as time went on, and after that first month, I had some good habits and uh, started feeling much more natural. All right, good to know. Um, Whitney on Twitter is asking, does NASA have a backup for the mission, or would, you, would another cosmonaut move into the position in that case? Yes, I've got a very good backup. Anne McLean is out here training um, right along uh, in parallel. She's going to have tests about the same time as I do to make sure she's ready to fill out that role, and we'll both go to Baikonur together. Um, so we always have a backup, and uh, Anne McLean, another American astronaut, is going to fill that role. All right, and can you just tell us a little bit about what you'll be working on throughout the mission, any science you'd like to share or other activities you'll be involved in? Sure, there's uh, um, the way I like to describe my job on the space station, it's like I'm a laboratory technician. So I'm not like a scientist. If I was a scientist, I would be making up experiments. I would be gathering the data. I'd be doing data analysis, writing papers. Uh, what I'm doing is I've, there's lots of other people that have done that work. But what I have to do is facilitate the success of their work. I have to install their experiments, make sure they have the right resources. If there's troubleshooting that needs to be done, I'm their hands to go ahead and make the changes to replace equipment. Um, so uh, an example, oh, I don't even know if I can say this word correctly. Um, one of the experiments going to work on has to do with uh, potentially helping out with Alzheimer's disease. There's something called amyloids um, and understanding the flow of amyloids, which can play a role in the jet in the, uh, uh, let's see, I look, look at this, make sure I get it right. Neurodegenerative diseases. Um, those amyloids can have an impact on that. And understanding how they flow uh, is important to understanding how they, how they work and the impact they have. One of the nice things about space is that you don't need a container. Uh, a, the dominant force can be the surface tension of a fluid. So you can do experiments on things in space where it's less complicated because you don't have the interaction with the container that would actually be skewing the results. So that's just one example of why the space environment gives us a unique opportunity to advance science in a way that we can't do on the ground. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have a question from Ratul on Facebook. What are the major differences you come across physically, mentally, and behaviorally soon after you reach Earth after a long stay in space? Okay, so physically. 
physically and mentally. So physically, my lower back bothered me, and I noticed it for some reason every time I bent over to put on my shoes or tie my shoes. Um, and psychologically, I was grumpy every time my lower back bothered me. Um, the immediate thing that I had going on, we t so we take some good medicine to help uh, prevent nausea. And I know it, a lot of people have a really challenging time when they get back to the earth. And moving your head uh, just makes it worse. But for me, the medicine worked fantastic. And when I moved my head, everything started spinning. But it didn't make me feel ill. So it just felt like a, an effect that I knew was going to not last very long, but was kind of interesting. So I would move my head really fast and everything would start spinning. So I kind of had fun with it. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, it stopped. Uh, I could not close my, we, we did some field tests right after I landed. Um, one of them was as simple as ringing a bell. I just stood up as quickly as I could. That was no problem for me. Another one was uh, ringing the bell and walking forward really fast, going around, turning around and having to walk back back to the seat where I'd come from as quickly as I could. As soon as I got around the cone and tried to pivot to come back, I basically went 90 degrees off the direction I wanted to go because I was just very off. That, that spinning around made me feel so dizzy that I, I just went off in the wrong direction. Uh, later on, they had this, me close my eyes, cross my arms, and try to walk heel to toe. And I was leaning on the doctor the entire time he was standing next to me. I could not, once I closed my eyes, I could not stand up straight. Within a couple of weeks, I, I, I definitely felt like all that was going away, other than some soreness. Uh, bone density for me. I lost 7% of my bone density on that first flight and really only got it back about six months ago, but I got it all back. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's take a question from Mariano on Facebook. This is an interesting one. Do you think in Russian when you speak in Russian on the space station, or are you translating your thoughts from English? Uh, it depends. Um, there are times when the language is familiar or there are phrases that I've used a lot where I just, it flows out. But if it's a topic that I'm not that familiar with in Russian, then I have to really think about what I'm saying and, and that could be, make it more challenging. I, I have run into an interesting situation with typing in Russian though. Um, I got comfortable with typing Russian just for various reasons, even sending an email to a Russian. Uh, but I was always thinking by individual letters when I typed in Russian. I'd have to think about every letter, where it was on the keyboard. And then in English, I don't do that. In English, I type, I think of the word and just flows through my fingers onto, on, onto, what else, onto the computer. So what I found was when I was trying to type an acronym, something that required me in English to think of individual letters, I was messed up because I would actually type the, the place where the Russian letter was. I had, a real, I had to always look at the keyboard to find individual English letters because I got so used to thinking of individual letters in Russian on the keyboard. Very interesting. Okay, we'll do one more call for questions. If you're on the line, if you have a question, please press star one to ask your question. And if you are on social media, you can ask a question using hashtag AskNASA. Um, so Mark, we'll wrap it up here if we don't have any more questions. If you just tell us a little bit about how you're feeling for your launch. Uh, like I said earlier, I once this got formalized, finalized, I finally gave myself permission to get excited, and I am very excited. Uh, not just about the opportunity to, to contribute, to, to serve all of humanity by being in space to do this science, but also because I really love the, the crew members I'm launching with. That Those two guys are great, um, Aljeg and Piotr. Also, there is some American uh, crew members that will be on the Dragon spacecraft that's going to launch a couple weeks after me. Uh, that I, for example, I had backed up Shane Kimbrough at, at one of his flights on a Soyuz. Um, he'll be on the space station with me. Thomas Pesquet, uh, I had been scheduled to launch and be on board the space station with him. He's a French astronaut. I get along super well with him. We have a lot of laughs and uh, I'll finally get an opportunity to actually be in space with him. And then Aki Hoshide, one of the Japanese, uh, a Japanese astronaut who's also on that spacecraft. He was the commander for a underwater mission that I did for nine days, in fact, along with Toma. Um, and Aki, I just have a great time with him. He is uh, he knows when to be serious and, and take on the role of commander and, and get us all online. But as soon as the opportunity presents itself, he'll uh, 
get ready to relax and, and, and crack a joke. And he's just a really a great pleasure to be around. And if I didn't me mention Megan MacArthur, I'd be remiss. Um, she is incredible too. I met her when I first got to NASA and was uh, trying to learn how to be a capsule communicator. She was a capsule co uh, communicator extraordinaire and of course a fantastic robotic operator on a um, Hubble mission on the space shuttle. So she's a very experienced astronaut who's gonna bring a lot to the group too. And uh, just a very professional person and a, pl a pleasure to be around. That is awesome. We can't wait to watch you all. Um, we do have another question from Facebook. So Gabriel is asking, how hard is it to become an astronaut? Wow. Har, har, har. I'm still trying to figure out how I possibly got this job. So I think it's you need to assume it's very hard, but you should never. If you want to guarantee you don't get the job, don't try. Uh, you. Here's another thing. What I would say is, if you want to be an astronaut. Find something that you love to do, and then you'll probably be more successful because you're doing it and you love it. There's going to be times when you have to do things you don't love. That's just how life works. Grin and bear it. Do, learn as much as you can out of it. But also seek lots of challenges. Find things that put you out of your comfort zone. Get into environments that, that maybe you wouldn't normally experience. All those things, I would say, are going to give you a very rich life and also help you out on the path to becoming an astronaut. But my intent really is to share with you that ideally, you enjoy your life so much that if you become an astronaut or not, that's just a bonus. That's great. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up for today, but I understand that we did have some technical difficulties on the satellite for just a few minutes. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that the video will be uploaded today at images.nasa.gov, so you can get it there and download it there if you need it. Um, and I just want to thank you, Mark, for being here with us today and answering all these questions. And thank you, everyone, for joining and watching and for asking your questions. Um, we will be watching you. Everyone can go and watch Mark and his crewmates launch on April 9th on NASA TV, online at nasa.gov slash live, on social media, or on the NASA app. Um, and be sure to follow along on Twitter and all the social media sites for updates. Good luck, Mark. We can't wait to see you launch. Thanks very much, Megan. This was really a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to share with all of you, and uh, thanks for your enthusiasm and curiosity.